Welcome back to the Locked In with the NBIC podcast. On today's episode, I have Sheriff John Staley. Guys, this episode is literally the first of its kind, and it's such a great, exciting episode and a different point of view. I got invited to Sheriff John Staley's county jail in Lowen Oak, Arkansas, where he invited me to meet some of the inmates, give a presentation on my life story, which will already be out on all platforms by the time you guys are watching and listening to this episode. We got to get an exclusive tour of the entire county jail. And more importantly, which is what you guys are about to listen to today, I got to sit down with Sheriff John Staley, a current law enforcement officer, which is something we don't usually get to interview. And I got to go in depth about his story, about some of the key elements to being a law enforcement officer in this day and age, and see what it's like to be the sheriff of a county jail in Arkansas. I really, really hope you guys enjoy this episode. I'm super excited about it. The set obviously looks a little bit different, but you guys are going to love this. Also, big thanks to our new sponsor, Lost Trail Communications. They provide affordable marketing and public relations services to small businesses, startups, and creators. Book a free consultation at losttrailcommunications.com and mention Locked In to receive 25% off service of your choice. Thanks again to Lost Trail Communications for sponsoring this week's episode. Sheriff Staley, thank you so much for coming on the show today, inviting us to your jail, your county jail. Um, this is my first time in a, in a jail after getting released from prison myself. I think this is a great dynamic, having an active sure. uh, sheriff and, and a former inmate talking and, and having this conversation. It's got to be had. We've got we've got to change lives. Absolutely. So, uh, wh- where are you from? Wh- where did you grow up? Right here in Lono County, Arkansas. Your whole entire life. Whole entire life. You know, I've uh, I worked as a data tech for a while, and traveled the country, and I always knew my dad was a police chief in BB, Arkansas, which is just north of us in White County. Police chief in Ward, Arkansas. He was in law enforcement for a while, but when I was a kid, he would drive a truck. And a lot of cops get out of the law enforcement to go drive a truck. It's a quiet time, I guess. You don't have to deal with so many folks. Um, somebody asked me the other day, what's it like being sheriff? Oh, it's the best job ever and the worst job ever all at the same time. Yeah. So but that's uh, Cabot, Arkansas is where I went to high school and elementary school. And, and this is where I'm from. When you were a kid, did you know you wanted to be in law enforcement growing up? Yeah. From a young age, because of your father? Because of my dad. My brother was a deputy sheriff as well. Is he an older brother? He is. Um, I have uh, three half brothers and a half sister from my dad's first marriage. They're all quite a bit older. I think I was an oops because um, my dad, he was. everybody thought he was my grandpa. And uh, he was 44 when I was born. My mom was 33. So I was one of those uh, uh-ohs, you know. Um, my brother was a deputy sheriff and a local law enforcement officer in one of the cities, Ward. Uh, in the north part of our county, it's Ward, Austin, and Cabot. And that's the Cabot School District. It's just the north part of the county. And uh, over in White County is BB, McRae, and it's kind of the same dynamics. It's just a small town. That's so interesting you said about uh, your your dad having you at a later age because my dad had me at 50. Yeah. But so he waited his whole entire life to have kids. He kind of did it reverse, and then yeah. he had my brother at 54, um, and now he, he's he's turned 78 this year. Yeah. What uh, time period did you grow up in? Um, I was born in 79. I'm 43 years old, so um, I guess the late 80s and 90s. Did really. you did your dad retire uh, while you were still a teenager? Or? No, he— when I was born, he was already driving a truck. So he had retired by that point. So, you know, it's one of those things where you get out of law enforcement sometimes. And it was a positive thing. He just, there's no money in it in Arkansas. It's not like Midwest and up in New York and different places where they, they actually pay their law enforcement. And uh, we're getting there now. It's taking some time. I actually interviewed a former county sheriff a couple of weeks ago, Kyle Overmeyer. I'm not sure if you're familiar yeah, with the yeah. story, but he ended up going to prison. Wow. He was a uh, the, the youngest elected sheriff in in the state of Ohio, and and he goes to prison, and um, 
he was saying that uh, pay at that time was like fifty or sixty thousand yeah. dollars. This was like at the early two thousands. Um, so it's interesting to hear that perspective. And he was also had a father yeah. um, that was the police chief. Yeah. So it's funny how the the, the paths align too. Yeah, you know, a lot of folks. It's I, I I when I go to speak to schools and different groups, um, I talk about cr- generational criminality, generational wealth. A lot of our folks that we deal with that have been in crime, that, that have been convicted, have been to jail, it's not their it's their family. They've learned it's a learned, you know, they learned the their you know, a lot of attorneys, they become attorneys. Their kids become attorneys. Well, if you've been in trouble, a lot of times your kids are gonna be in trouble. There's some families that we've arrested the when I started out in two thousand as a law enforcement officer. I was arresting senior, then I started arresting junior, now we're arresting the third. You know, it's just uh, sometimes generational criminality happens. Yeah. And I don't know if I'd made that up or not, but it's reality yeah. and it's learned. Yeah, I, uh, we saw that with Jimmy McGill on his episode that we recorded. Right. Right. His, his father was in the system. Yep. And, you know, other people that have been on the podcast. It's it's crazy, that, but it's learned. and And... We talk about this with our kids. My wife's a school teacher, and I've got three daughters, and um, 11, 13, and 21. So it's tough whenever you, you're trying to protect your kids, and in society you're trying to protect your kids. It's not a, it's not a given. You know, I've got three kids. One out of those three, they're going to have some issues. I, I guarantee it. My youngest, I can already see where you're trying to correct behavior at times, and it's just what are you going to do? You know, I don't, we don't spank our kids. And a lot of people are like, well, oh, spank them with a belt. If I'm mad, tell you don't do something, don't hit your sister, but I'm supposed to hit you. But how does that, I mean, what is that? There's different ways to do it. Just, that's how law enforcement has been doing for years is let's lock people up that are addicted to drugs. It's not working. Now, I wholeheartedly agree. It's your choice to start using drugs. But it changes the chemical makeup in your brain. It took me a long time to realize that and to learn that. Mm-hmm. And Jimmy showed me that. He, he was like, look, I don't want to be an addict. I don't want to be in jail. But what are we going to do? Um, we're going to start a peer recovery program. So, And not all law enforcement is at that level yet to see that. Right. They're not willing to have these conversations. When I was a young kid, a young officer, 21 years old, 22 years old, Went full-time when I was about 24. I knew, as you asked, I knew as a kid I wanted to be, when we played cops and robbers, I wanted to be the good guy. I don't like being the bad guy. Um, You've got to be a tough guy to do this job. And you're dealing with sometimes the worst of the worst. You know, there's evil in this world. And there's a difference. Some folks are just evil. That's the murderers, the rapists, the sexual assault suspects, the those that have been convicted to child molesters. That... There's problems there. Some of that's not going to be changed. But those who are breaking into houses to feed a habit, we've got to change what we're doing. Locking them up isn't working. You lock them up and they just, they're just they not getting anything but sitting back here fiending for another hit. I think Jimmy probably explained how that happened with the three trustees. Yeah. Um, it took me years to realize that locking them up, we can't lock up and arrest away our, our uh drug problem that's not working yeah. uh, you know no don't get me wrong if you're doing wrong in Lono county if you're selling drugs in Lono county you're going to go to jail uh if you're transporting it up and down interstate 40 just this morning state police stops a car 32 pounds of marijuana knock it if you want yeah it's weed but if you're transporting 32 pounds of marijuana in Lono county you're gonna go to jail it's illegal Personal use is a different story. Um, we, uh, <laughs> we've got to change that behavior, and what we've been doing is not working. Do you think all people, or do you think evil people are born evil, and do they have the possibility to change? Or does something happen along their journeys that turns them evil? I, I, think, I think there's some folks in this world that are just evil. I think there's demons in this world. I think that's, I think that's fact. I think some can't change. You know, there's some, I'm going to tell you, sex offender, 
who targets children, who is sexually gratified by children, uh, you're not going to change their behavior. I'm not going to walk in and tell you that whether you like guys or girls, I'm not going to change what you what you like. That's I can't change that. That's not that's not an addiction. Where drugs is a chemical imbalance that causes you to change. There's just some evil folks in this world, and that's what that's what we fight against every day. And trying to tell the difference. Sometimes you, I mean, sometimes uh, some are addicted to drugs too, and we've got some that get into our program that we realize just they don't want to change. They've got to want to change too. If you, we're talking about drug addicts and actual criminals, you know, there's there's a I think there's a difference. No, I've heard stories about correctional officers treating, say, the evil people like the sex offenders a certain way. Is h- how do you treat them as someone that is overseeing these officers? You're the sheriff. You're you're the man in charge. What is your opinion? And how do you treat them? Uh, you treat everybody the same. You give them the equal respect. Uh, you protect them. It's your constitutional duty as the sheriff to protect them. We're not going to get in there and, and treat anybody different. Now you've got to. Sometimes you, it, and it's through training, sometimes you have to protect those that are the worst of the worst, and people will dog you for that. I've got to protect them. The Constitution says while they're in our custody, you've got to protect them. So I've got to protect them from the other inmates as well. And, you know, I will not put up with the, we're, we're going to treat you with respect. That's our that's our job. So. Is it hard to leave sometimes your personal feelings aside? from the job on these situations? You know, it's difficult at times, but that's where you train. And with training, it becomes automatic. You know, yeah, it's tough. I mean, it's a it's a tough job. You know, you get out there and from doing CPR on a baby that's drowned, that went out and got in the pool, fell in the pool, you're the first one on scene. Mom and dad's trying to do CPR, you pull up. Sometimes you save them, sometimes you don't. And, you know, I'm, I am... Uh, I am not the most religious person in the world, but I do believe in Jesus, and I pray, and that's what gets us through it, is prayer. What's your view on the officers that we see every day on the news that don't follow their trainings and can't leave their personal feelings at home? Um, a lot of those are from the larger agencies. You know, when you're hiring so many people, psychological exams, Arkansas is one of the few states that require law enforcement to have psychological exams. And... But those are subjective. It depends on who's giving you that test and what kind of day they've had. It's all human nature. Humans are going to make mistakes. And you just try to train so you don't make those mistakes. So you just hold them accountable. You uh, you work with them. You try to lead by example. And we all make mistakes. We all do things we wish, oh, I wish I wouldn't have done that. You know, but you move forward from that and you learn. You grow. And that's what it takes. It's uh now, you know, with the national media, it's not always great, you know, especially with law enforcement and the national media has a narrative at times and uh, the mainstream media. That's why we want to talk with folks in situations like this and just be real. We're all human. Does the national media make your job a lot harder, a lot more maybe unneeded pressure in a way? Sometimes, you know, if they would, we here in Arkansas, we have tornadoes, Okay. And the only person that usually talks about a tornado is Jim Bob down the street, not because everybody else is working on cleaning things up. You may get the sheriff to talk to you, but then the eyewitness that seen the tornado come across the field. Tornado. <laughs> tornado. Um, so the tornadoes, you're dealing with somebody there that's only telling half the story. You know, and as you tell, you, you, you use your cameras. Um, that doesn't show the whole story. Because there's other people in this room with us today talking around us, helping make sure this works. Um, We've got to have the full story released. If we're going to release something, that's why in law enforcement, we're not allowed to release certain things during an investigation. But the media goes out and talks to Jim Bob about the tornado. And that's not what happened. You know, it didn't jump five or six houses. And he tells a story and they run with it. And they've got to come back. They don't come back and say, well, that may not have been completely correct. Once it's out there, it's out there, and it's going to be gold. It's going to be, it's going to be their information. It's fact. 
Yeah, I think that's my biggest, you know, issue with the media is that they're pushing one sure. one side of the story. I know like in criminal cases, a lot of the times it's the prosecutor standpoint because we as the defendants don't get an opportunity right. to speak because our lawyers are telling us not to. Right. And you're hearing the worst of the worst. And granted, some of that stuff true. could be true, but it does get twisted and it gets misconvened. That's right. So you experienced it. We experience it every day. You know, the devil, law enforcement, they're out to just arrest everybody. Well, as you can see here in Lono County, that's not true. We're here to help. Now, we will hold you accountable, and we will share uh, the training from a peer standpoint. I can tell you all day long, don't do drugs. Well, I've never done drugs. I don't know how it changes you. But what I can equate it to is being diabetic and somebody offering you a piece of pie, you're like, hmm. I'm going to eat the pie. If you offer me some chocolate pie right now, I'd probably eat it. But I'm diabetic and I don't need to. So I can understand to a point. But you're not going to listen to me as a drug addict saying, well, that's just the damn sheriff. He wants to arrest you. I don't want to. I want to save your life. I want you to be a productive citizen. I want you to get out and get a job. Do good things. Let's save some lives. And... But the media, it makes it hard sometimes. I mean, and law enforcement's human too. And that's always been a, a big point that I wanted to make with the podcast because we're not just giving inmates or right. former inmates a platform. We want to give law enforcement officers sure. a platform too to speak on and share their side. Otherwise, it, we're no different than the media if we only show one side. Right. And I'm the last person that would ever come out and say all law enforcement's bad because that's no different than saying all inmates are bad, former right. inmates. It goes hand in hand with each other. But there are some bad apples in the group that I guess make the rest of them look bad. And, you know, one thing right. I wanted to see, like I was reading an article, there was a video of you where someone made accusations of like right. a, a, an inmate getting hit or whatever. But you're not right. like meeting you in the first 10 seconds right. of meeting you and how you present yourself. You're not what the media made you out to be like in that video. Oh, that's true. You, you, you got two minutes of a situation. And you're going to judge me based off two minutes. Even daycares are tough. You got kids in there that bite other kids. You know, everybody's like, well, you know, you would think you've been in jail. You would think that if you get locked up, you're going to act right until you get out. This is the toughest place there is, is a county jail. Because you're, a lot of these folks that go to jail are addicts. But a lot of them are addicts because they're self-medicating mental health. And mental health is a main was one of the big problems we have. But as a sheriff, you're walking through there and there's 30 inmates and somebody tells you they're, they're cussing you out and they're yelling at you and you've got not only those 30, but the whole jail is another 130. So you've got 160 total inmates. You've got to keep control. Nobody wants to disrespect anybody, but whenever they're yelling at you and cussing at you and spits flying at you and they they say something to you, you, you act. We are human. Yeah. You don't want to injure anybody. You don't want to be mean to anybody. But, uh, and you don't, but then three, four years later, it gets twisted. Where was it three years ago? If, I, if I'm so bad, yeah, I'm tough. I'm not going to take anything from anybody. And if, if you're going to threaten me and make movements towards me, I'm going to, re- I'm going to respond. That, that was a horrible incident. Um, but we found the shanks and we made sure that Joe was safe at that time. That's what we were doing because our constitutional job is to protect all the inmates. And after a kiosk is broken, and they've taken a plexiglass and made it into shanks, as we know what they are, uh, knives, um, tools to injure others, uh, weapons, we found them and and secured them and uh, made the jail safe. Yeah, you were doing your job. Yeah. and. I urge anybody, come do a tour of the jail. Have you done a tour yet? Yeah, I did. it's crazy to be on the other opposite yeah. end of the spectrum. It, it would be horrible to be in jail. I get that. And that's why we try to understand. That's why we train our jailers to understand. But again, it goes back to pay. You're paying $15, $16 an hour. Uh, you can make that at Walmart. Yeah, I'm probably going to leave this to go to Walmart. You know, it's not as bad. Now, um, something about the county jail and the federal system, as a former federal inmate myself, yeah. we would always hear the worst of the worst of county jail. Like, that's a place you do not want to go. Why does it have such a bad rap? 
Well, they're pre-adjudicated inmates. There are some that are convicted, waiting to go to prison. Some are waiting to get convicted to go to prison. And, you know, if you're innocent until proven guilty. But I'll tell you this. You've been on the other side. I'm on this side. I'd say 99% of the people that go to jail are guilty of what they were accused of. Now, there's some that aren't. But when you're in the county jail, number one, you don't want to be there. I would love for every one of those pods that we have to have a microwave and a coffee pot. Everybody can wake up and they can make their coffee. They could heat up their water, heat up their soup. But I can't keep a TV in there without them trying to pop the socket to smoke green beans. At one point, we had to take green beans because they would let the green beans dry and smoke those. What good does that do? You got 30 inmates in there and you're looking up at the TV and they're getting on each other's shoulders to get up there and try to to pop the socket to get a spark to light a cigarette. Well, where'd the cigarette get in? How'd it get in there? If it wasn't the staff, it was snuck in there. So, you know, prison pockets. Anyway, the inmate sneaks it in in their cavities. And uh, you're going to smoke that? It's, It's like when Jimmy tells you the story about... The horse poop? Well, I don't know about <laughs> oh, that. But, he told us that story. Um, when in the jail, whenever they found that drug, they found dope on the floor. I don't know if he told you about that. Whenever the trustees were going in there, how do you think that that came in the jail? You don't know how it came in the jail, but they're going to eat it. That's the addiction that they. I'm not that addicted to a piece of pie. If it falls on the floor, I'm not going to eat it. If you snuck it in your pants, I'm not going to eat the pie. Yeah. But that was so, he was told no, he told him no multiple times. And, uh, you know, being a cop, it's, we're human too. We've got families, we have loss, we have love, and we're expected to be perfect every day. And that's what the media shows. They only show the bad. We've got so many good things that go on every day. Going to the schools, opening the doors while the kids get out, talking to the kids. Talk to those kids who don't have a family. And a lot of our, when I said generational criminality, I can target the kids in my wife's classroom just by looking at the, who their parents are. And I'm like, we need to talk to this kid. We need to, and not, we don't talk to them about their life. We just give them influence. Uh, I was, I'm a former school resource officer, a DARE officer, and uh, that's the, that was the best job I ever had, is getting to go to the school. And I was in a school district in Jacksonville, Arkansas, and uh, in Jacksonville Elementary, the SRO was a black officer, an older, older guy, retired Air Force. And when I put in to be SRO and I got Jacksonville Elementary, he told me, you're not going to fit in. I said, why? I knew what he was going to say, because the school was uh, 80% African-American. I was a white police officer. He goes, they're not going to trust you. Kids trust you. They want attention. The kids don't know what they don't know yet. They haven't learned that gen- the generational part of it, of what uncle has been doing or what dad has been doing. Some of them don't even know their dad. They don't know that mom got arrested. And I- I'll tell you a story real quick. We had two little girls, African-American little girls, the kindergartner and a second grader. They knew me as Officer John. Every day. I had snot rings around the, the, my pants where the kids would run up and hug you. Well, she'd come up and the second grader said, hey, second grader in kindergarten. She says, my sister don't feel good. I said, what's wrong? She said, well, my, she, my pee-pee hurts. I'm a dad of daughters, and I'm like, what? I don't know how to deal with that. So I go to the, the principal. We get a, the counselor and the nurse and uh, get her to the hospital. Um, she has a bladder infection, kidney infection, and gonorrhea. Wow. She'd been sexually assaulted, and that's hard because they trust you enough to come to you at school. And there's no disconnect between love. They know if you genuinely care. And that was a Friday afternoon, and DHS, uh, DHS has changed. It's a lot better than it used to be, but that DHS worker didn't want to come out. They said, well, we'll follow up on Monday. You heard what I just told you that we found out from the ER. We had to take her to the ER. I took her to the ER. 
with the ambulance. And they didn't want to come out. I said, well, I guess she'll just go home with me. And they came out. And they took her into custody. But uh, that's what we deal with. I had arrested their uncle. We ended up arresting him again. He was sexually assaulting them. Mom was, a, was an addict. And just a horrible, horrible situation with those kids. But I just go back to what that officer told me. He goes, you won't fit in. The kids love you. The kids are going to love you if you just show them. Like when you walk them at me, I try to act tough, but you've seen right through it. You know, I'm gonna, I'm a big teddy bear. Um, but like the, the line on your arm there, I, I don't have to prove myself to anybody, right? A line doesn't have to prove itself to anybody. He doesn't bother with those that, that are nagging. Just go do good. And that's what I've learned from that day back in 2005 to the day is just, just do good. Do what's right, not what's easy. And uh, and doing what's right isn't always easy. Absolutely. So, Did that incident help shape your morals as a officer going forward? Oh, yeah, because you want to protect everybody, and you know you can't. So you can only protect those you can protect. You, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. I can't save everybody. But those that come into contact with me, I can help. And... What I've learned is what hurts the most is those that are closest to you. They'll hurt you more because you care. And you can't, I can't get out of you what I'm going to put in. I can't expect that out of you. I may give 110%. I can't expect you to do that. And that's what I tell the deputies and the jailers and the employees. I don't expect you to put into this job what I put into it. I don't hunt. I don't fish. This is my, this is what I do. This is my hobby. This is my work. We hunt bad guys. Now, we are the hide-and-seek champs. Do not run in from Lono County because we will track you down and find you. Um, but once we run you down and track you down, uh, I can tell you Jimmy was one of those. Uh, Jeff Hamrick's one of those. Both of those in recovery today. They're different people. Can you tell me a story of someone that you weren't able to save and what happened? Um well, yeah, one of the trustees, Mikey with uh, – or John Wilson. John Louis Wilson was in – was a trustee with, with Jimmy McGill. We tried to – his dad's a preacher. We're the same age. Jimmy and I are about the same age as well. But John Wilson was 43 years old. He was a quarterback here in Lone Oak High School. His dad's a preacher. Um, we tried to – when we started this program, we, he was one of the first ones we tried to get in it. And I don't know if Jimmy talked to you about that, but he was he was told, uh, "Be crazy, it's not going to work. They don't care about you. It's like a us against them, and it's not. Now it's a dangerous game we play because we will, like I said, hold you accountable. Um, as you said, the media holds me accountable for sure. Uh, whether it's right, whether it's wrong, whether they know the whole story or not, they're going to try to hold you accountable for what you did or didn't do." But John Wilson, um, I'd arrested him probably no less than 10 times. And I had to go knock on his dad's door. Him and some other guys, the guys he was with, uh, one of them stole a camper trailer from a farm where I had my horses. It wasn't my camper trailer, but my horse trailer, my horses were there. And the guy that lived there, it was his. It was just as well to be mine because – you know the sheriff's horses are there. This guy gets out, hooks up, and drives off with his camper trailer. Of course, we put it out on social media that, hey, the sheriff's trailer was stolen, and here's a picture of you from the camera. The guy's like, oh, that wasn't me. Well, it was, because he had a very distinct mustache, very distinct walk. The camper trailer got dropped off, you know, two hours later, and an anonymous call to the sheriff's office said, hey, I think the sheriff's trailer is sitting over here on one of these turn rows. Nothing's wrong with it, I promise. And they hung up and went on. Well, they were with this guy. They were out stealing stuff late at night. The county next to us is Prairie County. They got into a pursuit, a vehicle pursuit. They lost the vehicle. They pulled away from him on a dirt road. They found the vehicle flipped over in a bar ditch. It's a, you know, it's just a drainage ditch around the farmland. John Wilson got out of that car with those others, and everybody went to run off. 
Well, his friends didn't stop. Whatever, he fell down and fell in the ditch face down, full of water. They didn't go back for him. He wasn't found for two days because they found the car. But, you know, this farmland's pretty expansive. And he was, he was quite a ways away, and they didn't know to look for a guy. They thought they ran off, which the majority of them did. But that's John Wilson. It wouldn't work for him, he said, and he didn't give it a chance. And uh, he's no longer with us. Wow. So I went and knocked on the door to his dad. And uh, he said, I ain't seen you in a while. I said, well, can I come in and talk to you? He started crying. He said, I knew this day would come. So it was tough. How does that make you feel when you have to do things like that as a part of your job? Um, it's tough. I get emotional. And uh, again, being tough, that comes with emotions. And I'm not afraid to show them sometimes because people got to realize we don't do this. I don't do this for my health, for sure. Um, there's been so many I've went and knocked on the door. Uh, you got to live with it. You got to own it. What do you think has been the toughest aspect of this job for you throughout your whole entire law enforcement career? Well, um, the toughest, I guess, it would be the last couple of years. Um, people that judge you and they don't know you. Kind of what we first started talking about. Um, I've always been the type that I'm not going to judge you until I know you, until I meet you. Somebody could talk bad about you. Well, he's been to prison. Why are you going to go on that show? Well, I don't know you. I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to fail me because I will fail you. I'm human. I will let you down at times because I'm not perfect. But I'm going to do my best to help you. And I guess the, the hardest thing in law enforcement is uh, is owning what these other deputies, the mistakes they make or the choices they make because you're the boss. As the sheriff, I'm the boss. I'm responsible for you even though I have no control over your actions. If you go out and do good, I give you credit. If you go out and do bad, I get the credit. Yeah. So uh, the toughest part is to realize that not everybody is going to put into this what you put into it. No, nor do I expect that. I just expect 10% because I know what I do every day. I just want folks to, uh, to know that cops are human. And uh, what I said earlier, there's some humans in this world that are evil. You, I'm sure you've seen that. I don't know which, which, uh, which, which prison did you go to? I was all over the place in the federal system. It's they the put me through diesel therapy. <laughs> Man. I was, yeah, I went as far as Wisconsin. So they just moved you around. They moved me around. I had, I had dated a guard's cousin, and it was a conflict of interest. And, uh, yeah, they, they ran. Cousin. Yeah, a cousin. Yeah. It, it was crazy. Not the guard. The no, cousin. no, the cousin. And he report. I guess he was like a super cop. According to U.S. Bank, 78% of small businesses fail because they lack a well-developed business and marketing plan. Lost Trail Communications is a strategic marketing and PR firm that offers affordable marketing and public relations services to small businesses, startups, and creators. As someone who has started and failed at many businesses at a very young age, I would highly recommend Lost Trail to help prevent you from making the same mistakes I made. Do you know why I agreed to have Lost Trail sponsor this episode of Locked In? They are huge supporters of those re-entering society from the justice system and love working to help those in need change their lives. Lost Trail Communications has over two decades of experience, and they specialize in creating marketing plans, go-to marketing strategies, social media management, and public relations support. They have worked with over 100 small businesses and creators across many industries, and they will take your startup, small business, or social media presence to a whole new level. They offer, they offer several different affordable payment options, including 0.0% financing. Most importantly, 
These guys get the job done. Schedule a free consultation by visiting LostTrailCommunications.com and mention Locked In when booking to receive 25% off any service you choose. Um, have you encountered and had officers under your watch that don't have that same mindset? And if so, how do you handle that? Well, you try to teach them and uh, you have them. They, they don't stay around long. If they, don't, they don't have the same mindset, the same vision as your leadership. They usually go on and they, they'll go somewhere else. And, uh, you know, you just pray for them. And uh, because it, it is a, it's a tough job. You know, there's some that want to just go out and write a bunch of tickets. I'm not about writing a bunch of tickets. I'm about each individual stop. I'm going to judge. I had a deputy the other day. He stops a car speeding, 71 and a 45, coming into one of the small cities. And the guy says, I'm calling the sheriff. Well, he did. But I was taking my kids to, to their new school, and I was happened to be right there. Never are you in the right spot. And I pulled in, and it's a new deputy. He was like, oh, my Lord, how did you get here so fast? Did he call you? I said, yes, sir, he called me. I said, let's go talk to him. I've known this guy forever. Walked up. Well, you know, I, don't y'all have better things to do? Catch these criminals out here? I said, sir, I've known you for a long time. He goes, yeah. We'd be out catching criminals if you weren't speeding, passing a car, the deputy stopped you. If you'd have been respectful to him, he would have gave you a warning. I don't know what he's doing now because it's his choice. I went back and he's like, well, I probably should write him a ticket. I said, look, I'm not going to tell you what to do. That's your, that's your choice. You're, the deputies, that's their prerogative. I said, well, here's what I do. Every time I've ever made a stop. But I remember my brother was a deputy. My dad had been in law enforcement prior to me. Um, and I learned from those guys. I'm going to kill you with kindness. When I walk up there and you're cussing me out, you're having a bad day, when you leave there, you're going to feel even worse because I'm going to give you a warning because obviously you're having a horrible day. I'm going to make you eat those words. No. You, you can call me whatever you want, but... That that fine's not going to help you change who you are. Absolutely. Then maybe kindness will. And that's a great way to look at it. So that deputy's like, well, okay. So he wrote him a wrote him a warning. I don't even know if he wrote him. He just walked up and said, "Sir, can you slow down for me? That's all I was wanting to do. I'm training a new deputy. He's a new deputy, experienced, but he's training another one." And I said, "Just kill him with kindness, you know." And you can't always do that. Here's a time and place you just. Uh, you gotta gotta hold folks accountable. If you're speeding, you're speeding. If you stop me speeding, I'm ready to pay a ticket. Yeah, I, I'm. I don't flash a badge, but you know, being a sheriff in Arkansas and most everybody knows you. They're like, slow down, <laughs> yes, sir. What's your day to day life like as, as a county sheriff? Well, mine. I heard you're here till three a.m. last night too. Well, I, I work all the time, okay. and um, I work with the guys. Leadership is about. Uh, putting myself where they're at. Um, if I'm not willing to do that job, how can I expect them to do it? So, yeah, I worked until late last night, and um, if there's a call come out and I'm close to it, I take it. I'm a working sheriff, and uh, we're big enough that I don't have to do it. But my staff, they deserve me to work with them. And uh, now there's a line there. You gotta, I've still got to be the boss. But as an officer, nothing made me feel better to see my chief or my captain or my lieutenant out working with us because that way you don't forget where you're at where you come from um my day usually um it goes back to not sleeping well because of what we've seen sometimes your dreams are tougher to deal with than reality so um, i get up in the morning listen to my kids argue my 21-year-old daughter still lives with us. She works at the school district as a para. My 13-year-old and 11-year-old arguing, bickering. You've seen the dog earlier. It's one of our rescues. Yeah. We've got seven rescue dogs, uh, 11 cats, uh, three mini, four mini horses, three donkeys, three big horses. Three donkeys. Three donkeys. Wow. Three big horses, five ducks, and a goose named Robert. Robert. Right. Okay. I'm not a cowboy. Never wanted to be, but we've got about 20 acres. My kids love them. And every one of those cats are rescues. Every one of those dogs are rescues. And every one of those horses, except for one, are rescues. 
the ducks are rescues, and the goose is a rescue. And uh, you can pet him too. Awesome. He's, he's a little weird, but you know, you got to look at you sideways. But my day consists of listening to girls argue a little bit before they go to school. I get, get dressed, and one of those rescue dogs that you've seen earlier now has to come with me every day. She's part of the program. She goes in there and hangs out with the, the office staff and the pack program girls. They And the guys, they give her baths, and they take care of them. It gives them something to do. gives them some pride. gives them something to look after. Uh, uh, then we uh, I take calls starting about 7 a.m. from everybody, from uh, speeders in their community to protection orders needed. How do you? How do I protect my sister-in-law? How, or how do I get away from an abusive spouse? Um, probably 150 calls a day just on that kind of stuff. Um, others, hey, I haven't seen you. You don't ever drink coffee with me. Well, I don't drink coffee. I, I'll come visit you at the gas stations, but I, 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 that's what I do. I take calls and put out fires. I, I should be a fireman. <laughs> so, What's the difference between a county sheriff and like a city police chief? Is there a difference? There is. Um, you know, half joking, but... Uh, we're not the police. We're we're the sheriff's office. Okay. And I get a lot of a lot of times people are like, you know, f the police. I'm like, heck yeah, we're the sheriff's office. We're here to help you. Um, the difference is that the in Arkansas the sheriff is elected. It's the only elected uh, executive that answers directly to the people. You know, we're the police chief is hired by a mayor. Who the mayor is elected by the people. But the sheriff is elected directly by the by the citizens, and I'm responsible directly to the citizens of this county. Under the Constitution, I run the county jail. We do civil process, and we have the duty to enforce, and we're responsible for all felons. And now if a city police department arrests somebody for a felony after first appearance, the responsibility of the sheriff. So I guess the main thing, we have a very similar job as a police chief. But we're responsible for the whole county. And each city, um, we have uh, Austin, Ward, Cabot, Carlisle, Lone Oak, England. They all have police departments. We have other, other communities that don't, other cities. Um, the sheriff is the chief executive law enforcement officer in the county. And uh, all that means in Lone Oak County is that when we go to Cabot, do as the Romans do, when in Rome. if Because you know, you'll have citizens who call the sheriff's office because they don't like what Cabot PD told them. Our policy is to talk to uh, talk to that city police department, make sure what they told this citizen was correct and legal and lawful, and then mirror it. We're not going to change it, you know, um, just because they want a different answer. Now, if that city department was incorrect in, their, in what they told that citizen, we'll talk to their supervisor and have them go correct that. It's kind of like, you know, in real life. It, yeah. We're not going to go over there and say, well, they're wrong. We're not going to get in turf wars. We, uh, our goal is to work with these cities. And uh, we have the same we have the same goals. We have the same job. Is uh, it like what we see on TV where it's like sheriff's office on the tactical vest and they're kicking down doors and that's like the, the sheriff's office is like more of a, I don't know, like a tactical, you know, kind of like a SWAT team in a way? Sometimes. Because if you call the sheriff's office, we're not – we're, we're – we're zero tolerance for sure while caring, you know, but um, we don't have a tactical team. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if, if the sheriff's office pulls up in England, Arkansas, it's kind of like having parents. I know my parents. I know how far to push my parents. You knew how far to push your parents. But when we were down at our friend's house, I didn't know how far to push my buddy's parents. So that's, the city – the citizens know how far to push their police department, and they, they keep pushing, pushing. But the sheriff's office or state trooper pulls up, they're like, wait a second. I don't, they have that same mindset. They're not sure what we're going to do. But, yeah, the, the sheriff's office, we're here to assist all the cities, all the police departments. Uh, we work well with the state police, the, the federal agencies. We uh, Now I'm a constitutionalist, and we're going to follow the Constitution. Our federal partners that come in here, they come to the sheriff's office, they talk to us, the U.S. Marshals, uh, the you know, the FBI, the DEA. We have a guy assigned to them, but they contact us and they work with us. It's not, 
we don't have the turmoil that some of the movies show you. So, <laughs> what's like been the the all time craziest arrest you've participated in? Well, that you like the top one. Um, man, there's been so many. Mm-hmm. It's uh, I don't know if I could just choose just one. Uh, Something that maybe sticks out that you'll never forget. Um, hmm. There's so many. It's uh. Well, like I said, we're the hide and seek champs. I have one guy, he's in federal custody now, but we've chased him every time he'd get out of jail. He'd be, he went through our program. He actually did good for about a year. I can't believe we let him in there, but um, he's back in federal prison. But I guess the best one, I guess to tell you, is uh, Jeff Hamrick. I'm going to name him and throw him out there. He's doing good now. He's just went through our program, you know, 10 time felon. 20 time fell. I don't know. He, he, they end up, you guys brag about that once you start doing good. <laughs> like Jimmy, I don't know how many he's got, but he'll tell you. 18 uh, or 19, I yeah, think he said. Yeah. yeah. So with Jeff, he, uh, he ran from us and he, uh, he ran for two days and he has my number. He, he's, he's from here. He has my cell phone number memorized because every once in a while he'd call and say, Hey, are you looking for me? No. I am now. Hold on. We'd run him. He had warrants. We chased him. Little Rock Air Force Base is just over in Pulaski County. Meets up with us. He ran from us, and he ran all over the county. We chased him. Was pinging his phone. Knew where he was at. We got out to Pulaski County with the sheriff's office, and he jumps a fence. It's about a 10-foot chain link with bob wire across the top, razor wire. He jumps it, running from us. And he gets to the guard tower because he's jumped onto there at Little Rock Air Force Base. He knew he was chasing him. He was like, oh my lord, I've really messed up now. So he had to come back and scale the fence again to get away from the Air Force Base. They would have been nicer. They 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 wouldn't have done anything. They'd have been like, hey, he's over here. But he had to jump that razor wire again to get away from us. And uh, that was one of the craziest ones. He uh, ran onto a federal installation to get away from us. <laughs> So Only to hop back over. Yeah, because he's like, <laughs> he didn't want to go to federal prison. So that's why he said he hopped back over. Something I've been really curious about, and I'm still learning as I go, is how come um, certain jails like get put into the, uh, like the, say the 60 days in shows, whereas like we don't see the federal um, prisons or some of what jail is really kind of like on the TV shows. Right. And like it even goes to today, like a federal prison would never have us inside the jail to record like the way we're able to do today, how, how come you guys are able to do that? Because uh, I'm the sheriff. I mean, so that's the difference between being the a sheriff, sheriff. The sheriff is a constitutional officer. He runs that jail, and uh, the sixty days in. I mean, that's that's a lot of liability. I don't know how they do it because if I if I I know you sign waivers, but there's some dudes back here, like I told you, and you don't know who they are. Some are just evil, and and. There's some that do things that they would never do because they're they're high. And if I put you in jail and you get injured, even if you sign a waiver, I'm, I'm like, no, that's not happening. You're not going 60 days into jail because I don't know. I can't keep you safe. Um, but, yeah, the sheriff's – I'm going to tell you, the sheriff is the – he's the boss in his county. Do 60 days in ever approach you to, to do anything? No, they haven't. It's okay. uh, No, it's uh, – and I, I don't think our, our attorneys would say, yeah, let's do that, but <laughs> – uh, the larger ones, I think, what is it, Atlanta? I think, yeah, yeah. I think they had it somewhere down there in Georgia. Um, we're so small. I say small. We have 150 beds. Um, you got to look at your staffing level, too. Can you keep that for, that person safe? Because they're undercover. The other inmates are supposed to not know. But you got camera crews. We're, how do they not know? Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Uh, are you aware of the power you hold and, and are you cautious of that and, and you keep it mindful of that on, on a day-to-day basis? Most certainly. And we, and we talk about that. You know, I'm, uh, I second guess every decision I ever make because you want to do it right. And a lot of folks, that's another thing, a lot of folks don't know about you. I don't know how folks go around and just think they're the boss. I'm, I have so many bosses we have over 33,000 registered voters, and there's over 70,000 citizens in our county. Every one of them is my boss. And every day you're weighing your decisions of, and 
you've got to fight not to do this, but you're, well, what is somebody going to say about this? Well, I try not to be like that. We're going to do what's right, not what's easy. Uh, you know, a lot of our cases, uh, you know, if I have to arrest uh, another public official, it's going to happen. I'm not going to, you know, not do my job because of a position somebody holds. But it is. It's it's um, it's very powerful, and you've got to you've got to be very careful. You've got to you've got to do it through thoughtful prayer. Do it with the, talking to your attorneys. Um, and just it's not that hard if you just do what's right now. It's easy. And that's a model I've been I've used my whole uh, most of my career in law enforcement. Yeah. Um, I have the, any law enforcement they have the authority to arrest you to take your freedom even to take your life if needed. And that that's a, that's tough. That's a tough thing to, to realize. And I don't think some people realize that. That's why we, when I took office in 2013, elected in 2012, I was 33 years old. And um, that's young. Very young. The yeah. first thing everybody told me is, you're too young to be sheriff. What? So I turned 34. I take office as sheriff. They were right. I was too young. Uh, you want to get out and work? You want to get out and run and gun and arrest the bad guys? But I got lucky because my family had been in law enforcement. I got lucky. I wasn't that rookie that went out and just wanted to write a bunch of tickets. I got lucky because I have a half brother who went to the penitentiary for selling marijuana. He was an addict when he got out. And that's before I was in law enforcement. That's when I was a it's my hat, brother. So it's it in the early '80s. I was a little, little kid, little baby. But when you look back, you're like, "Look, I've arrested some of these guys back here in this jail. Will tell you they're my cousin. Some are, some aren't. But now, would I arrest my mama? She five years ago yesterday she passed away. No, I wouldn't arrest my mama. But I'll, I'll tell you another funny. We're in a group of people, and this 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 person's telling them, "Well, I'm their cousin. I'm, I'm sheriff's my cousin. I'm their sheriff's my cousin. I'm standing right there. I don't know who this is." And they're like, "Well, yeah, yeah. John Staley's my cousin. Jim Stanley's. I'm sorry. This Jim Stanley's my cousin." I said, "Is that the sheriff?" And they're like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." Well, I'm John Staley. I'm the sheriff. That's what I meant. <laughs> I said, "I'm not your cousin. I meant I meant Plas County Sheriff. Well, his name was Doc Holiday. You can't forget that name." I said, "That's not even the same." So you're going to jail. And I've had situations where I'm like, look, Ian, just tell me the truth. I'm not going to take you to jail. Just be honest with me. Well, remember, I'm not standing there by myself. And I'm not going to lie to you, right? I'm not going to take you to jail. But the officer's actually are. He is. <laughs> That's kind of tricky, right? But it works. Yeah. Um, as a sheriff, what's your opinion on, and, and as a sheriff that runs his own jail, okay. what's your opinion on the use of solitary confinement? Man, the the stuff I've studied on that, that's, uh, that's tough. Now, there's times you have some that you have to do that to for the safety of everybody. Um, but it's not, we don't have a, our jail doesn't have a lock you away cell. It's, uh, as you see, it's, there's pods. We have had to retrofit a pod for one of our guys who, uh, we have one here now. He's in court now. Um, they're having a hearing on, is he competent? You had, we had to put locks on the outside of the door, padlocks, because you could defeat the locks on the door with a string from the mat. Yeah, it really, I mean, it's every jail that's built like this one, and most of them are built like this one. But every law can be defeated if you're if you just take your time. Really? So, so do we, you have any escapes at all? Any escape attempts? Oh, we've had two. Uh, do they make it out or no? Because the place uh, is pretty secure. Look, I had one make it out. He was a misdemeanor waiting to go to Washington County. He was sitting out in our uh, intake or Sally Port. Yeah. And there's a holding cell there. He had a book. We had to do away with paperback books except for Bibles and religious, whatever your choice is. Well. As the jailer went to walk out, fed him. He's waiting to go for a misdemeanor. He tosses the book down. The door shuts and don't shut all the way. She walks in the other door. He, state police drives out because that's the one who arrested him. He skipped out the door. He was gone for 24 hours out in the wood. Behind this jail, there's probably 50 
uh, minnow ponds, goldfish ponds. You know what comes with ponds? I don't know if y'all have these mosquitoes. The mosquitoes down here are about the size of hummingbirds. He was out 24 hours. He was, I mean, he was eat up. I don't know. He would have got released for the court day after he got to Washington County and got a ride home. Somebody could have went and picked him up, but he ran off. Knock on wood, that's the only escape we've had that, that actually got out with a, well, we've had a second one. <laughs> that was one of the guys in the program. Um, when we first initially started it, it wasn't the program we have today. He was a trustee. He was four days from getting out. Four days. But his girlfriend had called him and said she was leaving him. So he changed his clothes in the bathroom and walks off. Well, we had him within 12 hours. I went to where she lived. She wasn't home. He had nowhere else to go. So I drove by, took one of the deputies home that was out looking, and we drove back by, got my way home. I'm by myself. It's a little trailer with no power. The door was cracked open, and there was a sweatshirt now on the porch railing. It wasn't there when I drove by the first time, so I stopped. I'm like, hmm, we got 800 square miles. I'm just waiting for the backup to get there. And I'm like, I ain't waiting anymore. So I opened the door and said, hey, sheriff's office, come out. He's hiding under a mattress. There's no bed, but it's, he's under the mattress with his feet sticking out. You know, like when we were kids hiding under the covers? Yeah. I was like, are you going to come out? Hello? And he moves his feet up under the covers. I just moved the mattress, got him up, handcuffed him, walked him out, and we drove off. I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, wow, she was leaving me. and So now you've got an escape charge. And you were getting out in four days. Four days. Is it a lot of pressure for you as the sheriff when there's an escape like that? Oh, yeah. The whole yeah. prison go on lockdown? and Here we go. You do lockdown, you do a head count. Like I said, we've had two. Um, now we've had one that in our jail. I wasn't here when they built the jail. We would have done some things different. And I'm sure the, the former sheriff, he's a good guy, he would have done some things different too because we go to the dentist. I don't ask him how he's going to fix my tooth. I just trust that he's going to do it right. Well, we had a report writing room. It's a door. Everything's secure except for that report writing room, like the ceiling you see here. If you move that, you think you can get out. Well, this room you can't. But over there you could. Ceiling tiles. Yeah. yeah. So he got up there in the report writing room, gets through there, falls through dispatch, like where we're, like we're, we're sitting here now. Yeah. I saw Fell the, through dispatch, yeah. crawled back up into the, and ended up at the end of the building down here. We're like, we're hearing him crawling. We're waiting until the end of the building. And this is like something you see on a TV show. It is. Because they're, remember, 90%, his name is Jeffrey. I won't tell you his last name, but he fell at the end of the, in between the wall. Sometimes there's a gap, about like this. Well, he was stuck, heads up, feet up. Help, help, help. Well, we're trying. We can't even get to you. I don't even know how you got to where you're at. So we had to bust the wall out to get him out. Wow. So What's um, the craziest story for smuggling things into the prison that you've seen? Man. Like, I'm sure you've seen some crazy shit. Well, this is pretty simple, but we've – I'll give you two. One guy, he was a trustee on the weekends. We check you. You know we check you. Well, he had his wife so uh, into his boxers, into the waistband, where he could carry some pills in. So – he comes in, well, they change him out, and guess what? They're patting it. They're like, are you serious? He's like, uh, well, they threatened me. Dude, you don't even go into the back. You stay. You go out here and you weed eat, and now you're going to the back because you wanted to, why? And there was a lady who snuck some in, and methamphetamines, you've seen meth before? No, I haven't, yeah. Okay, it's crystal-like. It's like a rock candy. It's like crystal. A jailer walks into my office, and she's happy. I mean, she is excited that the, this lady had meth on her that they found during the squat and cough. And uh, she's like, oh, look what we found. She sets it on my desk. I don't know who all listens to this. This is going to be disgusting. It had a shade of red, like a pinkish shade to it. She snuck it inside herself while her cycle was going. Oh, my God. And it's now sitting on my desk. And the female jailer sits in there and goes, that's a lot of dope. 
yeah, can you go wash your hands real quick? Get that the hell off my desk. She's like, well, yeah. I was like, she goes, washes her hands, come back in there. I said, put some gloves on. Because she didn't have gloves on. She had picked it up off the floor. Isn't that a funny color? She goes, yeah, I've never seen meth that color. It's kind of pink. I was like, and about that time it kicked in. She realized what, well, she got sick. She used her glove, had to put it, it's biohazard. It, it, that was the most disgusting thing that ever happened. But I was proud of her for finding the drugs that were smuggled in. So However, the squat and t- cough actually works? It did that day. And so overall, it's an effective method? Or do you think- I don't think so, but it, it uh, makes them think. Is it more just a dehumanize no, inmates? I, or? No, no, when you do it and you squat and cough, as you're visually inspecting, most of the time you can see if there's something there. Yeah, because I've never seen that perspective. Yeah. Like, so I, I don't get that view. I'm the sheriff. I don't have to. <laughs> we've, got, we've got employees for that. But, but as an officer, you you might have. Yeah, we, we've had it down. Well, I've never worked in the jail as a jailer. Okay. So as an officer, we drop them off to the jailers. And, uh, but you know, it's a fact. It's not de- – sometimes it is dehumanizing, but you do it so it's not a gun. Uh, one of our jails in Arkansas – they did that, and they saw a handle of a pistol. Mm-hmm. A handle of a pistol. A thirty-eight. How is that even a thing? Saturday Night Special with a hammer. The worst I've ever heard of was like the little mini cell phones, but no, that's uh, that was a pistol. Now it wasn't our jail, but it was a. Uh, that's where sheriffs get together. We talk. We're like, what's the craziest thing that you've had snuck in the jail? Yeah, ours has been dope, and uh, now I give a speech to every jailer that we hire. Do not fall in love in the jail. With an inmate. With an inmate. Have you seen that happen before under your watch? Oh, it's happened. It's happened everywhere. And what do you do when you find out like one of your staff is- I prosecute. You, you go right away? I don't, I don't give them a choice. I don't let them resign and go on. That's a breach of trust. And uh, we've had jailers that would leave and have somebody meet them at the McDonald's to bond an inmate out. You're no longer a jailer either. That's not – our policy says if – now, you're going to have family members get arrested. Report it to us. Say, hey, my cousin's in jail. That's part of it. You know, you, we got a job to do. Um, but, yeah, that's happened, in, that's happened in every jail. Why do you think officers risk their career and their freedom to have intimate relationships with an inmate? No, I don't know. Um, a lot of times it's a self-esteem issue. And the first three letters of convict is what? Con, C-O-N. Con. Mm-hmm. A lot of them are good talkers. Uh, you hear the noises behind us. That's our kitchen. We had a, a jailer one time. Um, I went to school with her. She had applied. Her brother-in-law was a lieutenant here. And she was going through a divorce. Um, it was his wife's sister. We were like, hey, go to work. We have a nepotism. I can't hire my family, but I can hire your family as long as you're not their boss. Um, that happened. Somebody she went to school with was in jail. They start talking, and you're like, it's not going to work. Do you think it's that same concept of like employee uh, or an employment um, office, workspaces, relationships where you spend so much time with someone? Is that the same dynamic like with the inmate and the officer? It is. You know, we've had others that – work the tower you know, our jail's built you have a centralized tower that can see every has a window to every pod and has cameras and you have the microphones and they stay on that button that's what they call it they stay on the button hey beautiful how's your day and that young lady was like that's inappropriate move on hey beautiful how's your day well she's having a bad day maybe you know even the guys we have females oh this is a great story God rest, Sally is no longer with us. She, she overdosed and passed away, but she was in our program, was doing pretty decent, had a relapse, and didn't make it out. She had a heart attack during that overdose. God rest her soul, but she would uh, she she was a character. I'd arrested her a couple hundred times. She was in jail, and she was pregnant. I'm talking pregnant like I am. Like, you see how big I am? You're hard on yourself. That's just right. So, <laughs> well, she's in there, you know, and it has a wife beater shirt on. You know, you know what I'm talking about, the yeah. undershirt? I have the news media with me because I'm very open. We're walking through the jail because the guy complained that it was dirty. Well, it's dirty because the inmates are dirty. As we're walking through there and doing this story, I open the jail door about a quarter of the way, and she's standing and she goes, hey, baby daddy. 
I opened the door the rest of the way, and there's the camera crew and the reporter with me. And she's like, I'm sorry, don't hit me. It runs off. I'm like, what the hell just happened? Sally, come here. Tell them the truth. She's like, oh, I'm just kidding. That ain't, ain't the baby daddy this time. <laughs> this time. And it was just a, you know, it, it was all lighthearted. But my whole thing right there was like, Jesus, what is this reporter going to say now? She knows she's joking. I know she's joking. It's funny now, today, five years later. And, but my whole fear was, how are they going to twist that? Yeah, that's that's tough. That goes back to the media. It's tough. Like you didn't know. I didn't know what they were going to take coming into it. us. Well, questions we sure. were going to ask you. I mean, anything could be twisted. That's right. And I just hope you don't. And but that's my my philosophy is I'm going to trust you yeah. until you, they give you a reason not yeah, to. You can burn me, and I won't ever do it again. But now, Sheriff Staley, one final question for you today. Um, what, what's your message? Why did you want to come on the show and speak about it in a world where a lot of current law enforcement sure. wouldn't sit down to do an interview like this? especially with a, a former uh, um, inmate like myself. I'm John. I have the uh, honorable distinction of being the sheriff in Lono County for the last 10 years. I just want people to know that we're human too. You're human. You made mistakes. We'll make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. We're going to do what's right, not what's easy. And we're going to move forward. And this, there'll be clips of this that are, that'll be taken from some of these folks that are haters of mine. And, oh, well, look, he'll talk to this guy. He won't talk to me. Or look, look what he said here. They'll take snippets. I'm sure I probably said things I shouldn't have said here. But what about any active cases? And you asked about the one in the jail. Look, I was very honest. I did a video. It's out there. You can, you can use it. I told him what I did. I'm the one that saved the video. Somebody released it three years later. Okay. I own what I do. This is a tough job. Anybody else Anybody else thinks they can do it better? <laughs> there were sheriffs before me, and there'll be sheriffs after me. Um, I truly do everything I can to help anybody I can. And anybody that knows me knows that's the truth. Whether they've said bad things about me or not, they know at one point I was the one that helped them up. Every single one of them. I was the one that provided for them, and I'm not going to do anything that's illegal, immoral, stupid maybe. We do some silly things, like maybe going on this show. No. <laughs> no. But Ian, I appreciate you having me. I appreciate you taking the time, your guys. Um, I'm just John. And everybody you see, what I, I guess the main thing I've learned is everybody you see in life have the same problems we have. Some are worse. Uh, you don't know what somebody's going through at the time when you're talking to them. So just be kind. Absolutely. And uh, that the worker at McDonald's, if you go into McDonald's and they get your order wrong, just be kind. I know it frustrates you. Just just be kind. Yeah, you don't know what they what day they're having, what they've been through, what their family's going through. Sure, sure. Um, your history, I, I, I looked you up a little bit into too much of a background, but uh, I'm proud of where you're at today. I'm proud of what you're doing. Um, you're very intelligent. And uh, just keep doing what you're doing. Keep making a change. And that's what I want to see, and that's, what, that's the reason why I did it. Jimmy said, hey, dude, let's do this. I was like, okay, let's do this. I love Jimmy. Oh. I, was, <laughs> I know. It's tough. He's no. tough. No, he's a good guy, a great guy, and, I, and I'm very grateful that he introduced us um, and sure. gave us this opportunity. And, again, thank you for letting us and inviting us here today, and we're looking forward to doing the, the cook-off with the, the guys here and getting That's... the ability to speak to them too and hopefully inspiring some you know, of my I, message and change. I don't eat potlucks. You know what a potluck is, right? Of course I know what a potluck is. <laughs> I do not eat at potlucks because I know – remember, i got seven cats. Yeah. I barely eat at my own house sometimes because we got cats. So – I'm going to do this today and be a judge, <laughs> I guess, for you. Okay. okay? Uh, I, thank you for taking your time. Let me let me be part of this. Uh, don't make me look too uh, – You want to be skinny. We got nah, you. Nah, that ain't happening. <laughs> do you have like a weight limit you're no, looking I'm, for? <laughs> you can't change beautiful, right? So <laughs> I own it. No, nah, you look great. The headphones were the touch. Was it? Yeah. I, yeah. I told you I have a big head. And, <laughs> and the only thing I've lost in law enforcement so far is – well, I've gained something too. Lost hair and gained a forehead. Okay. Right? It just keeps growing. 
I don't know where the hair's going, but God bless you guys, and thank you for doing what you do, and I'm proud of y'all. So.